All right, guys. I'm gonna. Sh all right, I'm gonna uh, talk to you guys about. Well, we're gonna pretend it's a jack o' lantern because Miss Brady didn't have time to carve it last night. Okay. Is all right. So we're gonna just pretend. Okay. Now a jack o' lantern. When you make it, you start off by. Um, you carve a hole in the top, and then you get out all the seeds and all the goop. And then you go to the face, and you carve out the faces. And then you put a smile on the face. And then when we get all the goop out, and we get the face carved, do you know what we do the last part? You put the light in it, right? Yeah, and then we put the light in the jack-o'-lantern, and then we put it in our window for everyone to see, right? Well, because we want them to see it. We want everyone to see our hard work. All right, now, Jesus, when we let Jesus into our hearts, <laughs> when we let Jesus into our hearts, he does the same thing. He gets out all the hatred and all the all the yucky goops in our hearts, and he. Um, sorry, I'm looking at my notes. <laughs> he picks and he and he cleans us out, and then he, we have Jesus's light in our hearts. Okay, so he puts a smile on our face, and his light inside our hearts shines for all the world to see. I don't know what you think of when you think of Halloween, but when you see a jack-o'-lantern on Halloween, I want you to think of Jesus' light inside of our hearts. Can you bow your heads and pray with me? Dear Jesus, help us let our light shine so that others will see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. Amen. Thanks, guys. So in late July of 1994... I moved with my wife and a four-year-old and a two-year-old from northern Georgia, where we were both going to school, to northern Illinois, where she was going to teach at Northern Illinois University. I didn't know what I was going to do yet. I was finishing up my dissertation. I had checked into uh, the colleges and universities around there, thinking that I would be teaching Bible. I had a folder with me of 52 rejection letters already from different universities that I had applied to. And when we arrived in DeKalb, we started visiting churches, and we visited Victory Baptist Church, the only Southern Baptist church in town, and had no more than sat down, and they said, pray for our pastor search committee. Their pastor of 11 years had just retired. They hadn't even formed the committee very well yet. They didn't have a profile yet, and I basically said, who's in charge of this? And I went and said, I just moved here. I've been a pastor for years. Where do I put in my application? God's provisional care, God's providence was clear in the whole process. And by the 1st of October, they had called me to be pastor there. And my understanding of ministry and their understanding of what kind of pastor they wanted fit exactly. And then 17 days later, I was bringing my kids home from daycare when a guy crossed the center line going 50 miles an hour and ran into us head on. I remember a moment of terror when I woke up with blood in my eyes, my glasses gone, both my kids screaming at the top of their lungs. And I said, Lord, help us, and passed out again. The next time I woke up, I was laying on a cold, hard table in the emergency room, and my wife was there, and I said, I don't think I'm going to make it because I was drowning in the blood of a punctured lung, and I could tell my life was ebbing away. By the end of the night, half the church was at the hospital praying for me. Why did God allow this to happen? Why did such a, a positive start end up with this? Was it all a mistake? Was it God punishing me for something? Was there a disowning there, or maybe was it that sense of God doesn't care, God's not present. Please look with me at Romans chapter 8, beginning with verse 28, and stand as you're able for the reading of God's written word. Romans 8, 28, following. Paul writes, we know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose, 
For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then are we to say about these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not withhold his own son, but gave him up for all of us, how will he not with him also give us everything else? Who will bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies who is to condemn. It is Christ who died or rather who was raised, who is also at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will affliction or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword, as it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long, we are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than victorious through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of God for the people of God. Please be seated. Providence is the idea of God watching out over us, of God's care for us. And we're going to look a little bit at this passage on providence. First of all, providence is about God's care for you and I. You know, I experienced that care in the days and weeks and months after that accident. The first huge providential thing is that neither one of my kids were hurt. My daughter was in the front seat and they picked glass out of her hair and she did not have a cut or bruise on her. My son only had a bruise from the impact of his safety seat where the buckle was. He turned three while I was in the nursing home and they quickly adapted to that and I remember him getting some cap guns for his birthday and running around having mock gunfights with the nurses at the nursing home where we celebrated his birthday. People prayed for me from all over the world. People stepped up and did things. The love of God was apparent in lots of different things. I had a miraculous recovery. At one point, the doctor, said, the doctor said, you will never walk well again with 21 broken bones, 12 below the waist, and 9 above. Folks, it's been almost 30 years. I can walk all day long. I can dance all evening long. I can't run, but that's a whole different category, unless there's a bear involved, and then I'll manage to do it, yeah. God was there in the everyday struggle. God was there through the pain in the nursing home at age 31 and all the losses in life. Providence says that the God who created us, the God who sent his son to die for us, loves us and watches over us as we journey through this world. You know, most Americans, when you poll them, say that they believe God exists. Even with the rise of those, the nuns that don't go to church or identify with a particular group, there's still a vast majority that say that God exists, and yet when you get right down to it, most of them don't realize how much God loves them. Because if they realize how much God loves them, they would be involved in the community of God's people. God's care is shown in giving us life and providing what we need and guiding our lives. God's care is there in that surprise provision of money when you got the bill, bills bombarding you and you don't know where it's going to come from. God's care is in that call from somebody who didn't know what was going on in your life, but it's exactly what you needed. That card that picks you up, that word of comfort and care provided by the people of God in many cases. God's care is there in that peace in the midst of the storm and that love that goes beyond explanation. God's care is there in the coincidences of life, the accidents of life that seem to happen at exactly the right time to provide exactly what's needed. And I can look back at so many of those 
times that God's care was there. But folks, God's providence, and this is important, God's providence is more than God giving us what we want. God's care goes beyond giving us what we want. Most of us, I mean, let's be honest, most of us feel like we could do a better job of giving us what we want than God does. You know, God might give us a job to provide for our living means when we just want a windfall. We want the winning lottery ticket. We want that unknown relative that leaves a huge inheritance for us. God might give us a bus line to get to work, but we'd rather have a Mercedes Benz to drive ourselves. You know, most of us think when it comes to giving ourselves things, we would do a better job than God. I remember uh, one of my former churches, we had a fellow show up and he said, I got a new job. It's a construction job. I need some tools. And so we said, okay, one of our staff will go to the hardware store and buy you some tools. And he said, no, I want you to give me the cash. And we said, no, we can't do that. And he stormed out angry and didn't take anything. We kind of have that attitude with God sometimes, don't we? No, 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 God, I don't want you to provide this way. I want you to provide another way. I want you to give me what I need. God delivers us from struggles and difficulties that we would rather avoid in the first place. Right? God, why did I have to go through that wreck? Couldn't you have just given me all those things that came from it in another way? without the trouble, without the issues. Look with me at Psalm 7120. You who have made me see many troubles and calamities will revive me again. From the depths of the earth you will bring me up again. Oh, wait, wait a minute. I'm praising you, God, because you've made me see troubles and calamities. You took me through the difficult times in order to Get me through and revive me once again. Why not just lead me around those times? Why does God even allow bad things to happen to the people that God loves? Well, that brings us to the second point of God's providence. God's providence is caring for us. But notice Paul also points out that God's providence is about conforming us into the likeness of Jesus Christ, conforming us into the image of Jesus Christ. God has a higher purpose for my life than just a rosy, comfortable slide through these years. Even though my purpose might be just for things to go well and everything to be wonderful and be happy all the time, God has a deeper purpose for me and my life. Look with me again at Romans 8, 28. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. That's, that's a great verse, isn't it? We want to stop right there and just kind of like rest on that promise. Now, go to Romans 8, 29, the next one. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn within a large family. Ooh, now that conforming stuff. You know, you, you, you take a rock that you dig out of the ground and you turn it into a jewel. There's a lot of pounding and heating and polishing and a lot of squeezing. You'd make something conform to a space. If you ever tried to put too many things into your suitcase because you might need them all on a trip, there's a lot of shoving and pushing and manipulating. For me to conform to Christ... There's got to be changes. There's got to be often deep changes. And they don't come easy, those changes. God has to pull and shove and beat and press and process. And guess what? Suffering, pain, disruption, uncomfortableness plays a huge process in God's providence of conforming you and I, to the image of God. Remember what the scripture says about Jesus? 
he proved his sonship by his obedience to the Father, even to the point of death. You know, there are a lot of people saying, Jesus, just, just get him with a lightning bolt. Just show us your power and take over and straighten everything out. But the Father said, go to the cross. The Father said, do for them what they can't do for themselves. We have a Christian concept that you do not find in a whole lot of other places, even in other religions, that says there is a benefit from sacrificial suffering. We follow the guy that's got the nail marks in his hand and feet, that's got the spear mark in his side. We follow the guy that says, take up your cross, a cruel instrument of execution and death, and follow me. We follow the guy that says, the one that loses their life will gain eternal life. And sometimes we too have to be formed and transformed and conformed to the image of Christ by hardship. Corrie Ten Boom, the famous Dutch lady that wrote The Hiding Place, which has been made into several movies, whose family was hiding Jews in Holland during World War II, and they were turned in by somebody that was angry with them, and her father died in a concentration camp. Her sister died in a concentration camp. She was only saved by a clerical error, and she went through terrible suffering in that process. And then she went through the rest of her life Telling about how God provided through that. Telling about the love of God in the midst of the worst human evil and suffering. Talking about how God took all these bad things and made them into good. And her character, who she was, was shaped by the hardship that she went through. To the point that she was able to forgive one of the cruel guards who became a Christian after the war. I've known those folks in every church that I've served. Mature Christians who reached that maturity. People that you went to for advice. People that had a spiritual depth. People that you could just feel Christ in them that reached that point because of the struggles they went through. John and Roberta had a daughter-in-law that lost her eyesight and then her and her husband had a grandchild of theirs that was born with severe mental and physical handicaps and they loved that boy like crazy he died at the age of 10 these were people that had no special education weren't special leaders in some way in the world and yet people went to them for spiritual advice all the time because they had been conformed in the hard knock world of suffering to be more like Jesus, to be able to embrace Jesus. Elizabeth, a friend of mine who lost a leg, amputated because of complications from diabetes, one of the most loving people I ever encountered. And after she lost her leg, guess what? She was still one of the most loving people that I ever encountered that went through terrible pain and suffering and always cared about those around her was always focused on being there for someone else, always testified to God even in the midst of that loss and that struggle. Providence can send us to the school of faith and the main courses taught in the school of faith come through struggle and hardship and suffering. It's when we really reach the depths and find out that God is there, when we really listen to that incredible love when we really experience that goodness. It's not an easy lesson to learn. It's the boot camp of the soul. I remember laying there in that nursing home after I'd gotten out of the hospital with casts on all four limbs and people coming in and say, well, at least it'll build character. And I said, I got enough character to last for a whole long time. I mean, even before the accident, people always said he's a character, right? So... <coughs> Often, we only see the results of the works of providence conforming us in hindsight. It's hard to see it when you're in the midst of the struggle. It's hard to see it when the pain is there. When you're afraid of what might happen or you're upset about what 
is happening. It's only when you look back that you see that God was at work there, that faith was shaping you, the hand of God preparing and changing and guiding you, and yes, even holding you tight. Faith makes us realize that God is out to make us into the best. And you know, when I reflect back upon my 61 years, you know the times that I felt the closest to God? The times that I felt like I was living up to my full potential, being the best that I could be, was in the times of struggle. As a single parent, going through a long case for custody, dealing with the fallout of that accident, the times when I was fulfilling what I needed to do were the hard times. You know, these veterans, and many of you are veterans, when you get together with them and you hear their stories and you hear about what's going on, it's not the good times that they reflect on. They might tell some funny stories about that, but what they really reflect on is what they went through with the people they got the closest to in the hardest times, the most difficult times, the times of sacrifice and care. God calls us beyond our comfort in providence to be our best, to be made into the image of Jesus Christ. So God cares for us in providence. God conforms us in providence. But God also confirms that we belong to him when it comes to providence. God's plan is, encompasses our entire journey, our entire life. Look with me again at Romans 8.30. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. This is the whole Christian journey. From before you're a Christian to when you're justified and made a Christian, till you're glorified in eternity in the image of Christ. And Paul uses the past tense of every stage because it's so sure that even though it hasn't happened yet, he knows it's going to happen. And guess what? When you're in the process of that, when you belong to Jesus, when you're on that journey, you realize that heaven is your destination It's a great place to go that God has planned for us, but it's not your goal. Your goal is being like Jesus. Your goal is loving God with all your heart and your mind and your strength and your soul and loving other people as you love yourself. Your goal is to be conformed to the image of Christ, and heaven is where we end up as a part of that. And Paul goes on to say that nothing can separate us from God's love. It's not just that God exists. That, that's the part that a lot of people assume or understand in some way. What we have to tell them is the other part, that God loves you despite the struggles in life. That's not evidence God doesn't love you. God loves you and wants the best from you. God wants you to belong to him. God has the power to do that. God uses all things to work to good for those who love him. Notice it doesn't say God makes all this stuff happen. This world is full of stuff that goes against the will of God, that breaks God's heart, that God is opposed to. This world is the realm of sin and evil. But God can take that junky stuff, that terrible thing that happened to you, that struggle that's in the depths of your soul, that stuff that you've gone through, and God makes that into something beautiful with the work of of providence within us, confirming his presence all along the way. He takes our troubles and our accidents and our losses, and he makes great things from it. You guys have heard many of the stories. Heard about the young preacher that went to school in order to teach, did his doctorate, ended up in a little church in Montgomery when a woman refused to get in the back of the bus because of the color of her skin. And this guy that looked to be really disappointed from how things turned out ends up being the leader of the civil rights movement, Martin Luther King Jr., that we continue to look to for guidance in the nonviolent way that he led that. You know, I recuperated from my accident. 
People saw what was going on in my life and in the life of others as a part of that. About a year later, I got a big insurance settlement because it was completely the other guy's fault. And so he had to pay, or his insurance did, for that accident. And within a few weeks, found out that I was going to be going through a divorce and that I needed to get custody of my kids. It's not just that I wanted to, but for their sake, I needed to. And went through a long custody battle, but because of that accident, the church trusted me and stuck with me through it all. The money from that insurance account allowed me to hire a good lawyer and be able to have a chance, even though she had a doctorate in child development and I was a Southern Baptist preacher. And there's a few prejudices in the court system that goes with being a Southern Baptist preacher in Northern Illinois. And I could look back at that time and I could see the hand of God in ways I never could in the middle of it, providing for the next thing that happened. And then the hand of God in that providing for the next thing. And the hand of God providing in the next thing. That, that 2020 hindsight of looking back and seeing how God is there. God's smiling face is what providence is about. God's care in the good times and the hard times. Not removing struggle from our life not removing evil from our life, not putting us in a little ball that protects us from everything, but using those bad things to create something beautiful in our life. The very image of Jesus Christ. God can redeem even the terrible, awful things that have happened to you or that you've done. God can redeem your your sins that were so harmful to others or to yourself. God can redeem your mistakes that cost you so much. God can redeem the things that happened to you that you had no choice or no control over. God can make it all into something beautiful. It's a little bit of an earthy image, but I tell you, the image that caught my eye when I went to Oklahoma right after I found out I was going through a divorce and was thinking about God's hand and everything, and I was walking along in the country, and it's cattle country, and there was a big cow plop. You guys know what a cow plop is. Nasty, stinky. And in the middle of it was a flower growing up. And I thought, there it is. Life is the cow plop, and God's growing this beautiful flower out of the midst of it. Many of you have been to physical therapy in one type or another. When you go to physical therapy, they tend to push you to your limits so that you get some good results from it. Now, your attitude can be, this person doesn't like me. This person wants me to hurt. This person's making me do terrible things. This person is against me. Or your attitude can be, this struggle that I'm going through and this pain is in order to get me to a better place so that I can live life in a fuller way. This person cares about me to the point of wanting the best for me. That attitude that you have a choice in when it comes to physical therapy can be the same way that you react to God and the providence of God. It's there to care. It's there to conform. It's there to confirm that God loves you. It's meant to be embraced. When the hard times hit, folks, when the rough times hit, don't push God away. Don't blame God. Don't get angry at God. I mean, you can holler at him if you want to. God takes that really well. The psalmists do it all the time. But realize that God loves you. And despite how it feels at the moment, God has the power not just to get you through, but to make something beautiful out of the experience to redeem the pain to the glory of God and to make you to the image of Christ our Lord. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you for your incredible love that you have shown to us in Jesus Christ and help us to be the people of Christ that are obedient even to the point of death, Lord. Help us when the hard times hit to turn to you. 
Help us when the struggles are there to reach out to you and to allow you to love us, even though we may be upset at the situation and the conditions. Help us to be your people in the midst of all and to see that incredible love that you have. A God who did not spare his own son. A God that has the power to keep us from being separated from him no matter what the world and the forces of evil throw against us. A God that has the power to overcome. A God that brings victory out of what the world sees as defeat. A God that takes the worst and makes it into the best. Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name.